Right, welcome back, everyone. Today we'll continue our discussion on chapter number six, which is control chart for attributes. Right, so so far what we have seen in our discussions is control chart for variables. In which case you have um, control charts for quality characteristics that can take real values. Right, in this case it can um, the quality characteristics that we are interested in can only take attribute data, okay? So attribute data, to understand attribute data, we have to just quickly look at some examples. Attribute data is anything that is discrete or qualitative. So think about values or quality characteristics can, that can only take values zero. and let's try to see where these type of quality characteristics are observed. And two quick examples are uh, on the left-hand side, I'm showing you an example where your quality characteristic can either take a value as good or bad or acceptable, not acceptable, right? So you can see it can either take it, it, the quality characteristic that we're interested in right now is binary. On the right-hand side, you have an example where we are interested in the count of the number of defects. So think of this as a semiconductor wafer. And on this semiconductor wafer, we are counting the number of count, the number of defects. And there is another term that is used in quality control context, which is called non-conformities. Non conformities, okay? And in general, you will encounter, even in this case, in this chapter, we'll encounter two types of attribute data. The first one is binary, which we just saw, uh, either good or bad, acceptable, not acceptable. So in, the, in, in case of binary data, we, what we try to do is we try to group items in a sample and compute sample fraction non-confirming. Because if you think about it, if you have just zeros and ones, it would not make a sense, it, it would not make sense to construct a control chart with just zeros and ones. So what we instead do is we group items in a sample and then we compute a sample fraction non-confirming for every sample. And then we plot a control chart on that. Second one is count data. In count data, we don't have a problem like this. In count data, we just count the number of non-conformities. And thus, that does the job. Okay, so again, we have two types of data as I talked about just now. Uh, the first one is binary data in which you compute the sample fraction non-conforming. And then I'm giving an example. So in this example, if I'm looking at sample fraction non-conforming, then I have this one is non-conforming, this one is non-conforming and this one is non-conforming. So sample fraction non-conforming, in this case would be something like three by divided by eight. Three are non-conforming and total number of items in the sample is eight. And then I'm giving an example of, you know, a number of non-conformities. This is just, I took an interesting example from a research paper to show you what type of non-conformities exist in semiconductor wafers. And keep in mind, these individual circles that you see here, these are individual atoms. So I just was curious to show you how this looks like. Okay, perfect. Let's move forward. Uh, let's start by the first case where quality characteristic is binary. So in this case, uh, if quality characteristic is binary, we start by defining p hat. p hat is equal to, p hat is defined as sample fraction non-conforming. 
Okay, and then the formula for this is number of non-confirming items divided by total number of items in the sample. Okay, and then this is equal to x divided by n. All right, now if you think about x, x is the number of non confirming items in a sample of n items right and let's say let p is the probability p is the probability of a non confirming item in that case if you remember chapter number two x essentially follows a binomial distribution with parameters n comma p right and so now if i know the distribution of x all of a sudden i also know the distribution of x over n so in that case, I know the distribution of p hat. Now, why I'm saying this? I'm saying this because if I have to construct a control chart on p hat, I would need to know its mean and its variance. So if I know the distribution of x and I know the distribution of p hat, so I can derive its mean and variance. And the resulting control chart, which is the control chart for fraction non-confirming, is called a p chart. where we are interested in computing mu p hat and sigma p hat. Now, x follows a binomial distribution. So I know that expected value of x, this is equal to np, and variance of x, this is equal to np times 1 minus p. Okay, p hat is x divided by n, right? So I can write down expected value of p hat this is equal to expected value of x divided by n, which is simply p. And then variance of p hat, this is equal to variance of x divided by n, this is equal to p times one minus p divided by n. So that gives us the variance and the expectation of p hat. And we can derive sigma of p hat from here, which is square root of p times one minus p divided by. So now I have the mean and the standard deviation so I can construct my control chart and the control chart is pretty straightforward. UCL is equal to mu of w plus z alpha over w, z alpha over two sigma w CL is equal to mu of w. This is just a general model for a control chart. Okay, and so plugging in the values, you will get p plus three square root of p times one minus p divided by n. Center line is just p, LCL is p minus three square root of p times one minus p divided by n. And then this is your p chart. Okay, all right, now this is, uh, in this case, we're assuming that P is given to us, right? Many cases, P is not always known to us. And if P is not known to us, we can in fact compute P from data. So how do you compute, compute P from data? Let's look at how the data would look like. Um, let's say when P is unknown, You can have data that looks something like this. You have index one, two, three, dot, 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 up to M. You have, for each sample, you can have person number of non-confirming 
units or items. Let's say for each sample, you have number of non-confirming items. Let's call it X1, X2, X3, dot, 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 to Xm. So for each sample, you can compute fraction non-confirming, which gives you X1 over N, X2 over N, and so on and so forth till xm over n and now if you take a grand average of this you get p bar p bar is equal to summation of xi divided by n i is equal to 1 to m and this quantity right here actually we have to divide this with m this quantity right here p bar can be used to estimate p hat right so now all we have to do is if p is unknown everything remains same ucl remains same except that we replace p with p bar its estimate p bar one minus p bar divided by n center line is just p bar and lcl is p bar negative three square root of p bar one minus p bar divided by n okay all right, let's take a look at an example here very quickly. The question is, frozen orange juice concentrate is packed in six ounce cardboard cans. By inspection of a can, we may determine whether when filled, it could possibly leak either on the side seam or around the bottom joint. Set up control chart for 30 samples of n equals to 50 cans. So we have individual sample numbers that goes from one to 30. For each sample number, we have number of non-confirming cans. So if you divide these number of non-confirming cans with 50, you'll get the sample fraction non-confirming for every sample. And then eventually you can compute an average of that that will give us P bar, which in this case is equal to 0.2313. And so now if I have to construct my control chart, I'll just do UCL equals to P bar 0.2313 plus three square root of P bar two three one three one minus p bar two three one three divided by 50 and that gives you 0 0.4102 central line is equal to 0 0.2313 and then lcl similarly same formula except for minus it's 0 0.0524 so that gives you uh, a p chart Right. And then uh, I have made the corresponding control chart here. And you can actually see here that there are two out of control samples here, which is sample number 50 and sample number, sample number 23. And in this case, uh, this is actually coming from a real data. Uh, so if this is coming from a real data, and if you know what are the assignable causes, so you can actually go back and fix those assignable causes. And if you're in phase one, remember, if you're in phase one, when you're trying to construct the control chart, at that point, you would want to remove these outliers and then reconstruct the control limits. But if you are in phase two, you do not revise control charts. Your control charts are always fixed. You can just find out what are the issues with these out of control conditions. And if you find some assignable cause, you go back and fix the system, right? That's how, to, that's how we can interpret this. Okay, now a quick generalization exists for a p-chart and that's called an n-p-chart. For an n-p-chart, instead of computing the sample fraction non-confirming, we compute number of non-confirming items, which in this case is n-p plus three square root of three p, sorry, n-p, not, not three p, times one minus p, CL is equal to NP and LCL, this is equal to NP minus three square root of NP times one minus P. Okay, so that gives you uh, LCL, CL and UCL. Okay, before we move forward, I do want to mention about the important aspect about uh, discrete or, or attribute control chart and that is related with what happens when a sample point is lying on, this, on the control limits. 
Now remember, we never encountered this kind of situation in chapter number five, a control chart for variables, because if, if the quantity that we're interested in is a variable, if it can take infinite possibilities, if it's a continuous random variable, then probability that it lies on a line, takes a single numerical value is zero. But for discrete and um, attribute data, the probability that your random variable or your quality characteristic will take a single numerical value is not zero. So there's a very well possibility that your sample, that the observation that you're making could lie on the control limits. And if so, if sample, if a sample lies on control limit, or control limit lines, then the sample is out of control. Okay, we consider that sample to be out of control. And then there's slight differences in how we compute type one and type two error. Not big of a difference, but a little bit of a difference. So type two error, which is beta, now, again, remember, we can't use the traditional formula that we used in chapter number five. To compute beta, we have to use this formula. This is probability that sample is inside control limits. I can take off these images, given the process is out of control. Okay, and then this is equal to probability p hat is less than UCL greater than LCL given the process is out of control. That's the definition we'll use here. Okay, so we're essentially saying that a sample is outside the control limit if it lies either below LCL, uh, I would say below LCL and Sorry, it lies inside the control limits, right? So it lies inside the control limits if it stays inside these two control limits. Now you see, I'm not, I see how I'm not touching the control lines because once you touch the control lines, then it becomes outside, out, out of control, okay? So I'm avoiding touching the control lines. Now, if I have to compute this probability, I can break this down into probability. <coughs> probability. P hat is less than UCL given OOC minus probability P hat is less than equal to LCL given OOC. Now let me try to explain why there is less than equal to in the second term. If I have to compute the probability inside the two lines on the right, I would compute the probability, all the probability that is below UCL. So this is this probability right? And then I will remove all the probabilities that are below LCL, including LCL, right? And that's why I have a less than equal to sign there. And if I subtract these two green lines, I get the desired probability, which is inside these two lines. That's why I have a equal to sign there. Okay. Similarly, we can compute type one error. So type one error is type one error is equal to probability sample is outside, sample is outside control limits. Given the process is in control, this is equal to probability that p hat is greater than equal to UCL, or less than equal to LCL given process is in control. And again, you can break this down. You will get, not break this down, but you can transform this into one minus probability P hat is inside the control limits, less than UCL greater than LCL given the process is in control. Okay, so that pretty much defines what our type one and type two errors would be. Let's take a look at an example and try to understand this. A control chart indicates that the current process fraction non-confirming is 0.02. So P 
is given to you as 0 0.02, n is given to you as 50. What is the probability of detecting a shift in the fraction non-conforming to 0 0.04? So fraction non-conforming is changing from 0 0.02 to 0 0.04. And what is the probability of detecting this on the first day after the shift? So the probability would be probability of detecting a shift on the first day after the shift, given the process is out of control. This is equal to probability P hat is greater than equal to UCL, less than equal to LCL given the process is out of control. Now we don't know UCL and LCL. So let's quickly compute them first. UCL, this is equal to P plus three square root of P times one minus P divided by N. If you plug in P 0 0.02 and 50, you would get 0 0.0794 and then LCL is LCL is actually just zero. Actually, if you compute LCL, you get a negative number. And whenever you get a negative number, you just make it zero because frankly, fraction non-conforming can never be less than zero because it's a fraction non-conforming, right? It is negative, so I just made it zero in this case. And that's how you do if you ever encounter a quantity which is supposed to be positive, but turns out to be negative. For instance, if variance is negative, you know, you make it zero. Okay, so now returning back to answering this question, I have probability p hat is greater than or equal to UCL is 0 0.0794, greater than or equal to zero, given processes out of control. Now, how do we compute this probability? Actually, answer to this question goes back to chapter number two, where we talked about sample fraction non-confirming. So if you go back to that chapter, you will find how to compute this. I'm not going to repeat that again, but I'm going to walk you through it. This is one minus probability p hat is less than point um, zero seven nine four and greater than e, greater than zero, given OOC, and I can write my p hat as x divided by n, where x is the number of non-conforming items and n is the total number of samples. And then what I can do here is I can replace, I can multiply n both the sides. So zero times 50, and then I can also multiply the right, right side with 0 0.0794 times 50, given OOC. Now the problem here is the number on the right hand side or on the left hand side can always be, can always only be in teachers. So we talked about this in chapter number two, to make sure that this is an integer, we take a floor of this. Right, and then this sign becomes less than equal to as opposed to less than, right? Okay, so now we have done this, it becomes one minus probability x is less than equal to three, greater than equal to zero given OOC, and x follows a binomial distribution with parameters n, which is 50, and P, which is, now this is where you have to be very careful. The process is out of control, so your P is not 0 0.02 anymore. The P has shifted to 0 0.04. So you'll use P as 0 0.04. And now you can plug this into your calculator. And if you plug this into your calculator, you can uh, find out the answer, which should give you 0.269. All right, good. Now there's one little complexity when we are constructing control charts. Many times what happens is every single time you observe a sample, the number of items in one sample could be different. For instance, in the previous example, we assumed that there are you know, fixed number of samples, uh, fixed number of observations in every sample. In this case, we assumed n equals to 50 for all the samples. That may not be always true. For instance, in this example, for every sample, the second column is giving you the sample size, which is different. And if this is the case, then you have to use uh, some modifications to your p-control chart. And then there are three different modifications to the p-control chart that I'm going to talk about. 
The first one is exact method. In exact method, you really don't do much. You just compute UCL I as opposed to a fixed UCL. You compute UCL that depends on the sample size. So UCL I is P plus uh, three square root of P one minus P divided by N I. Notice I have N I as opposed to N, right? So your, your, your UCL, your LCL might change as N changes. P one minus P divided by N I. And then the corresponding plot is right here. You can see your control limits is going up and down, up and down, up and down, right? It's not stagnant. And then there's one out of control situation here. I would call this as OC sample. Okay, second method is using an average approach. So average sample size. And in average sample size approach, what you do is you compute n bar, which is equal to one over m summation of n i, i is equal to one to um, m, and then use n bar as opposed to n. So your UCL is equal to p plus three square root of p one minus p divided by m, sorry, n bar. CL is again fixed to p and then LCL is equal to p minus three square root of p one minus p divided by n bar okay so that's your average approach and then this is your average approach you have a fixed ucl fixed lcl but you see now very interestingly we are not actually able to capture this out of control situation but this is where it gets a little bit you know challenging because average when we talk about average average in some ways averages out a lot of the information Right, and then it me some of the changes it or some of the situations might not be captured very well in an average uh, control chart. Right, so there, there there could be some challenges to this, uh, and it may not always be the best approach uh, to use. Okay, so now let's move on to the last one, which is our just slightly less intuitive, but very informative. Less intuitive, but more informative. This is called a standardization approach. Standard, standardization. What we do in this case, we compute a new statistic called ZI, which is equal to PI minus P bar divided by square root of P bar times one minus P bar divided by n i and instead of plotting p i now i'm going to plot z i right and then z i is what i'm going to track and then your ucl is equal to three your lcl this is equal to negative three okay and now when you use this standardized approach now again you have a fixed uh fixed ucl fixed lcl but notice uh you are able to accurately find this out of control situation, unlike the average method, right? So this kind of like gives you the benefit of both the average method having a fixed control limit, and then it is also able to accurately capture all the different, the, the one out of control situation here. So we might want to just quickly review all of these three methods. So you have variable width, average, and standardized. Variable width is also what I call as exact method. Now, you'd want to use uh, variable width or the exact method if you want to be more informative. So this is more informative. Average is just easy to use and easiest to compute. So this is easiest to compute. And then this is also easy to monitor. Easy to monitor. Now, on the other hand, standardized method, 
This is easy to monitor, might not be easy to compute, but easy to monitor. And this is also more informative, more informative. Although it's a little bit less intuitive, I must agree on that, but it is again, it is, it is equally informative as the exact method. All right, let's stop here. Uh, I'll see you guys next time and I'll talk about the rest of this chapter. Thank you.